Hi, and welcome to this screencast about working with sets of polynomials. Let me first explain what we're about to do here in the next unit of material before we dig into the math. Over the next few days, we're going to try to think about how the concepts and methods of linear algebra can be generalized to work with other areas of mathematics. Specifically, we're going to consider some mathematical objects that you're familiar with, and a few that you're not familiar with, that are not vectors in Rn like you're used to, but which behave in certain ways very similarly to vectors in Rn. Those similarities are closer than you think, and as you'll see in a few minutes when we talk about polynomials, those similarities are quite strong and quite interesting. In particular, we're going to look at several different sets of objects that have vector-like properties and ask, can we do vector arithmetic on these things? Can we define some concept of linear transformations on these things? And can we define and use other important linear algebra concepts with these things like linear independence, bases, and subspaces? So why are we doing this? Well, in mathematics, whenever we learn concepts and methods, we always want to ask, do these ideas generalize to other things? We do this in grade school when we jump from basic arithmetic to algebra. We notice that addition of numbers always works no matter what order you add things in. And so we ask, does this always work? Later in school, we ask, does addition commute in this way if I'm adding not numbers, but functions or matrices or polynomials? So taking a concept and then adding a layer of abstraction onto it it is both totally normal and totally human, and it's the right approach to take when we're studying any kind of math. So without further talk, let's look at a set of objects that aren't vectors, but which have some strong parallels with vectors. So a polynomial is a kind of mathematical expression that we're all familiar with. By definition, a polynomial in the variable x is an expression formed by taking constants, by which we mean real numbers, and multiplying them to powers of x, and we restrict the powers on x to be zero or larger, and integers, so that no negative powers of x appear and no non-integer powers of x appear. And then we add them all up. The general form of a polynomial looks like this. We call the constants here the coefficients of the polynomial polynomial, and the highest power on x that we see is called the degree of the polynomial. So for example, here are three polynomials. The first one is p1, and it's a polynomial in the variable t. We'll often use t rather than x in our studies here. You'll see, or you see that the coefficients here are 1, 2, and negative 5, and it has degree 3 because the highest power of t here is 3. Notice also that not all powers of t have been included here. Here we don't have any quadratic term, and that's okay. In the second example, it's another polynomial in t that has just one term, the quartic term, and so it's degree 4. The final example, p3, is a constant polynomial. The only term there is the x to the 0 term, if you will. So numbers themselves are a special kind of polynomial. Now polynomials are really familiar to us. We've been working with them since middle school, but they have a surprising similarity with vectors. So let's first define a couple of important sets that we'll return back to. Let's let p be the set of all polynomials in a given variable, and perhaps more importantly define p sub n to be the set of all polynomials whose degree is n or smaller. So for example, p1 equal to 1 plus 2t minus 5t cubed is an element of p3 because its degree is less than or equal to 3. It's also in p4 for the same reason because its degree is less than or equal to 4. But this polynomial is not in, in p2 because the degree, which is 3, is bigger than 2. Likewise, 6t to the 4th is in p4, and it would also be in p5 and p6 and so on, but it would not be in p3. So we're going to focus on the set Pn, because there's a kind of natural similarity between Pn and sets of vectors. For example, if you look at this polynomial from P3, it kind of reminds you of this vector here on the right that's an R4, where the coefficients from the polynomial are the entries of the vector. Now this makes sense because in a polynomial, the variables themselves don't really do much. They're just placeholders for the coefficients. So we can really think of a polynomial as just simply an ordered list of numbers, which is what a vector is. In fact, many programming languages, uh, vectors are represented internally by the computer precisely as ordered lists of numbers, which is to say they are represented as vectors. So P3 is closely related to R4, and in general Pn is closely related to Rn plus 1. Now that similarity is natural, but it's not just superficial. Let me point out three properties that polynomials in Pn have that you should really take notice of. First of all, the set Pn is closed under addition. That means if I take any two polynomials from Pn and add them, I get another polynomial that is also in Pn. 
Here's an example in P4 that illustrates this, and it makes sense that the example generalizes, because if you take any two polynomials whose degree is less than or equal to n and add them, the degree is not going to go up because we don't do anything with the variables. We're just adding the coefficients. Secondly, Pn is also closed under scalar multiplication. Now by scalar here, we mean just a real number like we always do. Here's another example to illustrate this, but it ought to be clear that if you take a polynomial that has degree less than or equal to n and then multiply it by just a number, then you get another polynomial of the same degree, that is at most n. The degree is not going to change if you multiply by a number. It's only going to change the coefficients. Third, there's an object in Pn that behaves a lot like the zero vector does in Rn, and that is the polynomial P equals zero, the constant polynomial. Now remember we said a minute ago that numbers themselves are a special kind of polynomial of degree zero. This polynomial here behaves like the zero vector in the sense that if you add it to any polynomial of degree at most n, you get that polynomial back. Now these three properties are sort of the big ones and we use in making Rn have the vector subspace properties that we discussed earlier in the course. And it turns out that Pn has all those same properties, although the objects themselves are not really vectors. So again, here we have a set of objects that are not actually vectors, but seem to have the same structure as vectors and even plays by the same rules as our usual sets of vectors. So it's sensible and interesting to ask the question, what kinds of linear algebra, quote unquote, can we perform on polynomials? And that's where we're headed with this section of content, so stay tuned.